So corporate America is very strange. Companies have invested lots of time and money into figuring out ways how to motivate their employees to work harder and actually give a shit about the companies that they work for. They've tried every single trick in the book except ironically actually paying them more money. Looking at some modern examples of some of these techniques that businesses have cooked up has resulted in some of the most cringe inducing videos uploaded to the internet that you've ever seen. We've got the classic Walmart fight song that might be the worst cover of We Will Rock You by Queen to ever exist. With lyrics like you're gonna be a cashier someday and you love this place moving those carts all over the place, it's no surprise that most of the employees sound like they have a pointed at their head forcing them to sing along. It really sounds like something a cult would do with their members chanting some weird sh that looks absolutely unhinged to anyone outside of the cult. There are also these agonizingly bland corporate motivational videos that show a company's mission statement to the employees to make them feel like they're a part of something bigger. Most companies have laughably generic mission statements that tell you absolutely nothing about the company just like Sony does. Fill the world with emotion through the power of creativity and technology. And it's like, Sony, come on, you sell TVs and PlayStations, the only thing you're filling the world with is discarded electronics that are ending up in a landfill. Also, to go on a tangent really quick, all of the comments on Sony's mission statement video sound like literal bots advertising for Sony. Sony, king of technology. Wow, Sony got forever number one. Sony is the best. Starbucks, though, is arguably even worse. To inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. They manage to make themselves sound like a small business in the first half, but then just randomly have a mask off moment revealing their master plan to infest every single neighborhood across America with a Starbucks on every block. However, what we're going to focus on in this video is actually a precursor to all of these very weird business practices. This is the insane world of industrial musicals. You know Broadway shows and musicals like Fan of the Opera or Hamilton? Industrial musicals are like that, except the stories and music are about the products that a company makes and the only people viewing them are shareholders and employees of that company. It's like a totally secret world of musicals that only a tiny amount of people know about and are only shown at trade shows or weird company meetings. And when I found out about these things, I was firmly down a rabbit hole and could not stop. I was listening to obscure podcasts, reading articles and listening to Spotify and YouTube playlists with surreal musicals on them about toasters and bathtubs. It was absolutely wild to discover this entirely unknown world of musicals that was basically totally lost to time. They were created to motivate employees to sell more products and promote loyalty within the company which perfectly encapsulates the values of corporate America. Get your employees to be more productive and work harder without actually having to pay them any more money. But before we get into some of the hilarious industrial musicals themselves, we have to travel backwards to find out where they actually came from. Our journey starts all the way back in 1929 when General Mills was on the verge of canceling production of their cereal called Wheaties. A few years prior, they'd created a radio advertisement with the iconic Have You Tried Wheaties jingle. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the brand. Won't you try Wheaties? You cannot tell me that that jingle is not one of the catchiest that you've ever heard. Anyways, the jingle never actually ended up airing anywhere until 1929 when it aired in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. It ended up being so successful that 75% of all Wheaties sold across America came from the Twin Cities market after that advertisement played on the radio. General Mills saw this and basically just said fuck it and changed their entire advertising strategy to be based around that jingle. And that one advertisement established Wheaties as a brand all across America and completely changed how advertising was done. After that, these jingles started permeating beyond advertising and companies started making jingles and anthems to play for employees internally within their company. If you've never heard any of these company anthems or songs from the early 1930s and 40s, you are in for an absolute wild ride because some of these songs are completely unhinged. One of the more widely known corporate song collections is called the Songs of the IBM, which is 
is one of the most certifiable things that I have ever listened to. Yeah, that sh** really existed. Sadly, most of the stuff from Songs of the IBM is nowhere to be found on the internet. Luckily though, we do have some transcripts and photocopies of the original songbook, and holy sh**, some of these songs literally sound like something Nazis would sing to Hitler. And this is especially ironic considering IBM's suspect relationship with the Nazis during World War II. This is a direct quote from a song that was dedicated to their current president of IBM at the time, Thomas J. Watson called our inspiration. To TJ Watson, we all honor you. You're so big and so square and so true. We will follow and serve with you forever. All the world must know what IBM can do. Yeah. That shit straight up sounds like a cult. However, I do think it's pretty important to contextualize why these corporate songs were like this during the 1930s. A lot of these our company are great type corporate songs were created in a post-depression era in America. So most people who were lucky enough to have a job at all were thankful to these companies and actually happily sang along. Not to say some of these songs aren't still extremely weird, but it makes a lot more sense when you look at the context surrounding when these songs Songs existed. These types of songs would end up being the basis for the musicals that the companies would create in the 1950s. And at some point after World War II, companies started to create full-scale musical productions with collections of their company's songs, and so industrial musicals were born. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these musicals because their content and storylines are utterly insane. The first one that I found through an NPR article was called The Bathrooms Are Coming, which debuted in 1969 and was made for the plumbing manufacturer called American Standard. Basically, it advertised the new bathroom fixtures that American Standard was releasing at the time, and the story in this musical is downright fucking bonkers. It starts off by detailing the life of a Greek goddess called Fema, who embodies female attitudes, desires, and reflections. From what I could tell, Fema Emma is not a real Greek goddess and is most likely based on traits from Hera, Aphrodite, and Artemis, but I'm no expert on Greek mythology. So if I'm way off base there, please let me know if you're a Greek mythology nerd in the comments. Fema gets called upon all women to start some type of bathroom revolution and to fight for bathroom safety and free all women from bathroom oppression, whatever the fuck that is. And the thing is, the concept of this musical is absolutely insane, but the music itself somehow manages to kind of be amazing. It was composed by Sid Siegel, who had composed music for 250 other industrial musicals and over 1,200 radio and TV commercials. I mean, to me, that's absolutely fucking crazy that one single guy composed 250 of these things. And it kind of makes me think that there are thousands more of these musicals that will never be heard of again and are relics of a time gone by. So the most popular song from The Bathrooms Are Coming has to be My Bathroom, and honestly, you just have to listen to it because me trying to describe it will not do it justice. My bathroom. You cannot tell me that my bathroom does not slap hard as f Then you've got the introductory song called It's Revolution, which could be one of the catchiest corporate jingles I've ever heard, and they never even used it for corporate advertising. It's Revolution! Bathroom Revolution! Hurry now, the bathrooms are coming! The bathrooms are coming your way! I think the craziest things about all of these productions is how high quality they are. Companies would hire top tier talent like writers, composers, orchestras, and actors to put on the most insane musicals that you've never seen before. And the quality did not come cheap. Chevrolet paid $3 million in 1957 to put on a musical to advertise their 57 product line of cars dubbed The Chevy Show. And this musical was shown for one single day. To put this into context, Sing It in the Rain from 1952 cost MGM $2.5 million to produce, and this was a musical that was going to be shown in theaters for weeks or months to recoup the production costs. It's absolutely mental that these companies were spending millions of dollars to produce these musicals that were probably 
probably shown only once or twice in all of history. One of my favorites has to be the 1963 Xerox production called Take It From Here, which had a full-length album created entirely based around just one single copier. There's just something so corporate and American about a CEO spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce a musical about their new product that was exclusively made for the employees of that company as a token of thanks instead of, you know, just paying them a bonus or some shit. These types of productions were booming for decades, however, all things do come to an end, and during the 1980s, the number of these musicals started to dwindle until the trend basically died out completely. The sad thing about most of these musicals is that there's basically no footage of them online because of how secretive the companies were about them, and only a few of the musicals ever produced final records to the employees that contained the music from the actual musicals. This serves as a call to action to anybody watching right now now that might have transcripts, photos, videos, or audio recordings of any of these industrial musicals because I think they need to see the light of day again. I'm going to leave some links in the description to some of the albums and collections that I found online if you guys want to check out some of these oddities yourself. And as always, thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.